Mike, I'm poor. Oh, I don't have money to pay for fancy IPs. Oh, why don't you use the public domain, man? You ever heard Ooh, of that? I haven't. They what got is that? Peter Pan and other stuff. <laughs> What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I'm Mike. We are the Brothers Murph, and today we're talking about our favorite games that are in the public domain. That use themes from the public domain. Yeah, so we've done lists in the past talking about our favorite IP-based games like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or something like that based on an intellectual property. And then now, but the thing is, eventually intellectual pro properties go into the public domain. Indeed, they've been around long enough. They become yes. uh, kind of free for everybody to use. And things like Alice in Wonderland, which you'll see on our list, or Peter Pan, yep. are things that are famously free to use. You, you can, can interpret them. them and do whatever kind of thing you want. Uh, you can do Winnie the Pooh. You can't do Disney's Winnie the Pooh. That's different, but Winnie the Pooh, the tale, is very much uh, just yeah. enter the public domain. And in fact, That's there's true. this like horror movie about Winnie the Pooh, and people are like, I don't know about this. You're like, you can't stop me now. So we're going to talk about 10 games that use the public domain in a really fun way. Yeah. Um, we're going to get to them right now. Number 10 a game that uses a public domain theme. This is the Neverland Rescue, which of course uses Peter Pan, uh, the tale of Peter Pan. This is a two player asymmetric game where one side is a hook and a bunch of pirates. The other side is Pan and the Lost Boys. And it's uh, kind of like a, a hide and seek, you know, one of those games where you're trying to get your opponents to think you're over here when you're over here because Hook is trying to find the five kind of uh, hideouts of the Lost Boys and stuff to win. So there's a lot of kind of that card play and mental games where you're really trying to get after each other. And I just love that as the Lost Boys, you have certain powers and stuff. And if you're a hook, you have entirely different goals, entirely different tools to use. You're using your henchmen to go around and root out where these Lost Boys and Pan are and stuff like that. Uh, Peter Pan is a really cool story. I think it's one that we all have engaged in to some degree or other. And so it makes for a really good theme for a board game. One that I want to see a little bit more of, there's this game that kind of I think it's just coming out or just delivering to people. That's this big game set in Neverland. It's got me really excited. But the Neverland Rescue is a really cool, asymmetric, fairly small two-player game that we think uh, makes a good use of a great theme. Our number nine is from a theme that we don't love that that much, but this is Cthulhu. Cthulhu in the game is don't mess with Cthulhu specifically. We also are not a big fan of social deduction games. We're not a huge fan of Cthulhu, not a huge fan of social deduction games, but they come together very, very well in this one. This is a social deduction game where some people around the table are investigators and some people around the table are cultists, you know, worshiping the old ones and that kind of stuff. And you are essentially trying to find the cultists and you're doing that well, actually, I, I suppose you're, as the investigators, you're trying to flip over these elder signs. If you get a certain amount of those elder signs, the investigators win the game, and the cultists want them to either flip over Cthulhu, which is like an instant loss, or to essentially waste enough time so that they don't finish it, the game in time and they end up losing and the cultists win. And the interesting thing about this game, the, the few social deduction games that Mike and I really like really come down to this. Is it easy for the traders to hide? If it's a game where it's just based off of who can lie the best, that's not a very good social deduction game in our opinion. But in this game, it's really, really easy to hide because everyone's gonna have three of these tiles in front of them. These are the tiles that either be blank, might have Cthulhu, or might have an elder sign on them. Again, the investigators want to find elder signs. And so you can choose someone like uh, Mary over there. Um, have Flip over the middle tile you have. And they flip it over. If it's an elder sign, it'll go in the middle of the table and boo, yeah, that's fine. That's awesome. We found another elder sign. That's great. But the thing is, is you know what tiles you have. You look at them, you go, okay, I have two elder signs and one blank. And so you can, you can convince people like, hey, pick me. I have two elder signs. But the problem is, is you don't know where they are because you will see what you have, but then you shuffle, 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 and then put them out. And so you know what you have, but you don't know where you have it. And so you like, look, two of these are elder signs. And so they go, okay, Nick, flip over the middle one. I flip over the middle one. That one happens to be the blank one. And I immediately look really suspicious. And I'm just like, no, 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 no. I, pr I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. The other two are elder signs. It's, that was the blank one, I promise you. And it's one of those things where it's easy to hide as a cultist because everyone has that situation where you have a two thirds chance of flipping over something good and they just happen to pick the one that's not good. And it's one of those things where it's it's easy to hide, it's, it's easy to look suspicious even when you're on the same team as, as someone else. 
and it's just really, really fun. And so you're constantly trying to convince people, and, and there's always that meta game of last time you were a cultist, so no one trusts you in this game. Even though this time you are an investigator, it works really, really well. We absolutely adore door don't mess with Cthulhu. It just, it just works. It absolutely works. And we love to play it, especially at conventions. We absolutely love don't mess with Cthulhu. It's so, so good. So number eight uses uh, famously Sherlock Holmes as characters that you can play and you're going to be pitted against maybe a real historical figure, Jack the Ripper. So this is Mr. Jack. There's also Mr. Jack Pocket, which is kind of a smaller version of Mr. Jack. Mr. Jack is a two player game kind of with hidden movement and hidden uh, identities, I'll say, where one player will be playing Jack the Ripper who is going to be uh, hidden amongst several characters, about eight characters that are around on the board moving around. And you on the other side are Sherlock Holmes and Watson and stuff, and you all come with powers and things you can do. And you're trying to basically figure out which character amongst all these people is actually Jack the Ripper. You're trying to find out the true identity of this uh, masked killer and stuff. So it's a great kind of, everyone moves your pieces around. Uh, certain characters will be in the light or in the shadow and based on who's basically visible, uh, you will declare whether or not Mr. Jack is visible on the board. And based on that, you might be able to deduce, okay, well that means it can't be this uh, character over here. It can't be this character. It could, it could be any of these three. And we're of course trying to pare it down until we have one and only one logical conclusion for who Jack the Ripper is. Each character like Sherlock stuff come with their own little powers and things you can do to kind of manipulate the game state and try to figure out, uh, basically root out who is not part of uh, this puzzle and stuff. Mr. Jack uses this kind of open board. You can kind of move around stuff. And Mr. Jack Pocket uses this kind of very stylized, I'll say, version of uh, creating like streetways with these rotating tiles. And that creates so, like what you can see uh, and where you cannot. And then also gives you like, you can see this character and that character, maybe Jack the Ripper or not to kind of deduce. It's really fun. It uses Sherlock Holmes really well because you're trying to solve a mystery and uh, what who does that better than Sherlock Holmes himself. So Mr. Jack and Mr. Jack Pocket are both really great kind of two player uh, head to head games that uh, let you be a super sleuth. And that's pretty cool. Number seven is Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe is in the public domain now. Adventures of the Cursed Isle, Robinson Crusoe. This is a big survival game where you'll be going through different scenarios, essentially. You're basically just trying to survive them. This game is brutally hard. So much so that this game would would be higher on our list if it wasn't so hard. Mike and I are so bad at this game and lose so horrendously all the time that it just kind of slightly, slightly dampens our love for this game. But Robinson Crusoe is a really, really cool game. And, and it's just, it's just survival. It's all cooperative and you're working together. You're exploring the kind of the island that you're on. You're trying to get food. You're trying to stay alive. You're trying to like go after these beasts to get more food, but they can hurt you. And all your characters have special abilities, but you just, you're just constantly getting hurt. And then the weather comes and it starts snowing and your, your shelter is falling apart and people are starving. <laughs> It's just so brutal. It's so hard, but it's really, really fun. And it's a really well done game. And depending on what scenario you're playing, you're gonna be doing different stuff. Sometimes the scenario is like, you need to make a big fire. So hopefully, you know, a helicopter or someone can see it and maybe come rescue you. So you're having to try, constantly try and get wood, constantly trying to get wood. Everything you're doing is based around trying to get wood. And you're trying to build this big thing. There's a whole bunch of different, there's expansions for this game. So there's more scenarios in there. There's also been scenarios that have just been kind of released as like promos or part of this little thing. So at this point, there's so much stuff to play with, but you're always playing in the same kind of sandbox. Just what you're doing in that sandbox and the goals you're trying to achieve are dis different based on the scenario. And it's really, really cool game. It's really fun. It's just so dang hard, but that's also Robinson Crusoe. We also could pick Friday, which is a really, really great solo game about Robinson Crusoe. And it's also brutally hard. <laughs> so that's just a kind of Robinson Robinson Crusoe thing, you know? And so Robinson Crusoe Adventures of the Curse, I was really, really good. It's also got like Vincent Dutre art, so it looks really nice. It's just a very cool game, but man, oh man, if you're gonna play this game, be ready for a just a really difficult game. So 
So number six uses Alice in Wonderland, a great theme that people have used through time, of course. This is Wonderland's War. So this is, uh, we refer to it as like Battle Quacks of Quinlanburg. And the reason we say that is because in this game, you're putting your hand and pulling out these really cool chits and trying to uh, win battles because uh, the different areas of Wonderland are... Uh, in, the people are battling for it to take ultimate control. There's war, open war going on between some of your favorite characters like Alice and the Cheshire Cat and the Mad Hatter. They've all gone a little bit mad and uh, they're really duking it out and stuff. So in this game, you kind of have two halves. You have like a tea party half where you are going around this big board, uh, in the central board, this big table rather, collecting cards. You're drafting out cards, which might give you additional supporters, which are more chits that go in your bag. You might uh, be able to engage, uh, interact with the Wonderlandian and get either more chits or a different uh, figure that actually goes out onto the board. You are accruing a little bit of madness along the way, depending on kind of how powerful these cards might be that you are taking. And then you're putting supporters into five areas on the board. And if you have supporters in an area, that means you are ready to go to war in that area to try to win and ultimately have some kind of area control to win points over the three rounds of the game. Once you do that big tea party, it's customary to have a battle afterward, or in this case, five battles afterward, uh, going in order. So you will go in order, and if you have supporters there, you're gonna start pulling chips out of the bag. They're gonna add strength to your area, but there's also these madness chips. If you pull madness chips, you're gonna start to lose your supporters. If you ever you lose all your supporters in the area, you go bust, you lose all the strength that you'd built up, you have no one left to fight. Uh, so there's a little bit of push your luck there and deciding when to really invest in a battle, when to back out and kind of take your loss, uh, but hopefully not go too mad. Uh, and then all the different chits that you pull have different powers and stuff. So there's a lot to explore and it's in a big boisterous production as well. That is Wonderland's War. Number five's general theme is just kind of all public domain stuff. And this is Gingerbread House by Praise B, Phil Walker Harding, Praise B. And this game, you are building out a little gingerbread house, you're placing down these domino tiles and you're placing them down and whatever, wherever you place this domino tile, whatever you cover up is what you're gonna get. So you can get different kinds of icing and you're gonna be attracting these different these different fairy tale creatures. And that's where kind of all the public domain stuff comes. Cause like Peter Pan's in it and like Snow White's in it. And then other things that aren't, technically public domain, but like the seven dwarves are in it, you know, all this kind of like fairy tale stuff that's all in the public domain now is all in this game because they can kind of just use everyone, right? And so you're attracting these fairy tale creatures to your gates and the problem is they're eating your house, you're eating your house. And so you have to have the certain kind of icing that they want, the certain kind of gingerbread that they want, and then you can capture them and we think kill them. But I don't think, the game says you don't kill them, but you kill them. Um, and so you are, brutally murdering these people. But no, you, so you're capturing them and those are gonna give you a point. And so that's what you're doing is you're trying to get all these different kinds of gingerbread to capture these fairy tale creatures to get points. And there's some objectives in the game for like, you wanna get these specific kind of characters or characters with this specific kind of gingerbread. But you're building your gingerbread house up on this little three by three grid. And so you're just kind of building it around. And there's also like stairs in the game to, um, essentially make up voids in there so you can put stuff down there flat. It's really, really good. And the cool thing is, is this game is really, really combo-tastic because whenever you uh, capture and kill a fairy tale creature, you get a little bonus tile, which is a, a, just a little square tile, and you'll put that somewhere and then Whatever, whenever you put something over that one, you can choose whatever you want that action to be. And so you can a lot of times be like, okay, I'm gonna get this one, we get this bonus towel, I'm gonna put it here, that's gonna give me one more thing, and now I can now capture this one and kill them, and then put down another bonus tile, and it's, you start doing these really satisfying combos, but it's a very simple game. It's Phil Walker, Harding, Praise Be. And so you know it's not gonna be like a heavy game, and it just works, it's cozy, it's good. I really, really like Gingerbread House, but all the characters you're capturing are all just kind of public domain fairy tale creatures like Hansel and Gretel and that kind of stuff. Just like, again, the classics you've seen all throughout your life that are all in the public domain, they're all in Gingerbread House because that's what you can use. And so Gingerbread House is a great game with a ton of public domain stuff because that's the best thing to use for a game like that. Number four uses the Cthulhu theme really well. This is a two player card drafting game called Tides of Madness. It's based on a similar game called Tides of Time, but this one adds that Cthulhu theme to it. So in this game, you are drafting cards to try to build out the most kind of successful tableau in front of you as you can. It's kind of standard set collection stuff where uh, each card you get will come with a suit 
and then come with a scoring condition. Those two things are not typically, uh, <laughs> they do not typically help each other. So you might have a suit that's blue and you're gonna get points for claiming red and things like that. So you're really trying to build a synergistic hand of cards and you're just going one by one back and forth drafting out cards. So of course, your opponent is very aware of what you're trying to do, as am I. Now the Cthulhu part comes in, in that A, the cards you're drafting are these famous Cthulhu type characters and stuff that are just super scary and wild and things. Uh, and a lot of the cards, the best cards really, will give you madness. And that can be a resource that you use because being a little bit on edge uh, can actually be pretty powerful for you and score you some points. However, if you get too far off on the deep end, you go completely mad and you can lose the game that way. So you wanna kind of play with fire a little bit there and you want to push it right to the limit without having someone throw you over. And there's a bunch of cards that have tentacles on them. And every time you take a tentacle, you have to take a madness token. So uh, that is the kind of trick of the game is how do I take as powerful cards as possible? Or if I see my opponents going a little bit mad, how do I feed them as many tentacle cards as humanly possible so that they can't help but go mad? You play over three rounds where every round you'll keep a card so your kind of tableau grows and grows as you go. It's really fun, really interesting, simple kind of set collection stuff, but with that twist of like, oh, at what cost do I get these points? Is it worth it? Can I possibly push my opponent over the edge into madness themselves and win that way? There's a lot of fun stuff. That is Tides of Madness. Number three is another Alice in Wonderland game. It's one, that theme is used quite a bit. And this is Paint the Roses. Paint the Roses is a deduction game where you are building out the queen's garden. She wants a big old rose garden, which makes sense. Uh, the queen of hearts is, um, the problem is the queen of hearts is chasing you down. She is, has, she wants her garden done, but she, if it's not done quick enough, she's gonna chop off your head. And so you are putting these tiles out and it's a cooperative deduction game because the queen has different whims, different things that she wants in her garden. She wants these things next to these things. So all the players are gonna get these whim cards and the whim card is gonna tell you essentially what the queen told you to do. So it might be like putting uh, spades next to clubs because you have different suits of card and different colors of roses. And so then you will put a tile out on your turn and then on that tile you will put how many matches that tile made for your card. So if we need spades next to clubs, what we could do is I put it here, I put down a spade tile and it's next to two clubs, I would put two cubes on there to say, hey, this makes two matches for me. But you also might have matched something for someone else, so they would put their cubes on that tile to show, hey, this also made a match for me. And then at the end of every turn, everyone has to guess on someone's whim. You obviously can't guess on your own, but everyone would be like, mm, okay, the only thing this can be based off of what's around it, the only thing this could be is spade to club. So let's guess, I think Nick is spade to club. And then if they're correct, you will reveal it. And then you get to move your little gardeners forward on this track. And then at the every, every, end of every turn, the queen is running forward with her ax trying to hunt you down. And so if you ever miss, you get something wrong, the queen will move double. And so you're constantly trying to stay ahead of her. And there are easy whims, medium whims, and hard whims. And the, media, the easy whims will always be color to color and you'll always know that. So you know that it can't be shape to shape. It can't be like clubs next to diamonds. It's always gonna be color to color. Medium can be color to color or shape to shape. And you know that. So if you're like, okay, Mary here has a, um, a medium. So this has to be color to color or shape to shape. But then hard can be color to color, shape to shape or shape to color, which gets very difficult. But when you fulfill a hard whim, you get to move for, forward farther on the track. And as the game goes on, the queen will start to speed up. When she starts the game, she's only moving forward one spot or two if, she's, if you get it wrong. But then she starts moving two spots every turn, then three spots, then four spots. And if you're moving three or four spots and you get something wrong, she then moves six to eight. And that is a lot of movement. And it's just so much fun. I really like cooperative deduction games. And this one just works so well. The art is so good. It's by Jackie Davis and it's absolutely amazing. And it's just got great production value. And it just, there's so few rules to the game. You can teach this game to dang near anybody. And it just goes over so, 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 so well. I really, really love Paint the Roses. It's one of my favorite games of this year. And it's got a really cool Alice in Wonderland theme on top of it because why not? You got a red queen trying to chop off people's heads. It sounds great. It's really, really fun.
So number two is Shakespeare. This is a game that, uh, Shakespeare is a historical figure, I suppose, but you are using uh, actors within the play that are the various characters from Shakespeare's plays, which are of course all in the public domain now. Uh, this game is so fun because personally we enjoy the theater. I do theater and stuff, so I came up doing Shakespeare, so there's a lot of kind of personal attachment to a Shakespearean themed game. Um, but the way they use your actors in the game being specifically characters like King Lear themselves. It's not like Hank who's playing King Lear, it's just King Lear and the art of course that comes with that is so incredible to us. It's just so vibrant and haunting at times. Uh, this game is just one that we, man, we got this early and have loved it and loved it and loved it and played it. And even in times where we kind of don't play it for a while, every time we come back to it, we're like, ah, oh, that's why I like this game. That's right, I forgot. Uh, the art's incredible, and something like Shakespeare has just been used as a public domain theme forever because it's very free to use, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> uh, so you can, uh, there's all sorts of productions, there's all sorts of movies, there's all sorts of ways that these stories that are made so famous by Shakespeare have been twisted and turned around. And I love a game that's just sort of celebrating Shakespeare and Shakespeare's works uh, kind of all together. It's just a beautiful place to uh, inhabit in a game. Uh, and one that, because of our personal attachment to kind of theater, keeps us coming back. So Shakespeare, not so much a uh, public domain figure, more of a historical figure, but the characters that, are, uh, that you are using and wielding throughout the game are very much from that public domain. So it's a game that we love and keep coming back to. And number one, I believe was also on our IP base list, but this is gonna be Unmatched because one thing Unmatched does, and it's actually all of our favorite sets are from public domain stuff. There is every public domain thing we've kind of talked about shows up in Unmatched. There is Alice from Alice in Wonderland. We have Robin Hood. <laughs> we have Sherlock. We have the Invisible Man. We have Jekyll and Hyde. We have Dracula and a whole bunch of historical figures. You know, we got Medusa, King Arthur, all of these different public domain things are also in Unmatched because one of the reasons why they have them is because they're allowed to use them. They don't have to pay any extra money. They also have like Marvel sets and they have like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Jurassic Park, but most of, a lot of their stuff is just public domain stuff or things that they don't need to pay for anyway, like having, oh, I guess Achilles and stuff. It's all public domain. And the public domain stuff, in my opinion, is the best of the unmatched stuff. It's always the most interesting. I really like the Marvel sets. I think they did a very good job with those. I like the Jurassic Park sets. I think they did a very good job with those. But the ones about just like myth and legend kind of characters, I always find to be so much more interesting. I really, really look forward every single time they have a non-IP based set. The IP based sets are great, but the non ones are so, so good. Like Cobble and Fog is probably my favorite set. That one again is the Jekyll and Hyde, Sherlock, um, Invisible Man, and Dracula. And that set is just so dang good. All the characters are so fun. And again, it's one of those things where they're always gonna be using public domain stuff because it's free. One of the sets coming up, I believe, is going to have Shakespeare in it because it's free, <laughs> you know? And so it's one of those things where it just works in a system like this, and they just do such a darn good job with it. I absolutely love Unmatched. I love their IP-based stuff, but I really, really love their Myth and Legends public domain stuff. So that is our top 10 games that use a public domain. It was a really cool list, and it's one of the things you kind of think about, especially like the Shakespeare thing, is like there's a lot of things that you kind of don't think about in that way, but you're yeah. like, oh yeah, this was um, something that used to be owned by somebody, Shakespeare, and now it's not. It's just kind of yeah. in the public domain. Everyone can make a Shakespeare play. Exactly, cool. it's part of why you see so many Cthulhu games. It's very free to use, which yep. is great, and it's also really cool. It was like when Snow White hit the public domain, all of a sudden there were like three Snow White movies in one year, you <laughs> yeah. know? You're, You're like, like, oh, that's why. Got it, got it, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the public domain is something that's really cool. There's so many famous stories from old that uh, we keep reusing because they're fantastic and they stand the test of time. Yeah. Let us know your favorite game that uses the public domain as a theme. Uh, in the comments below. Indeed. Until next time, I'm Nick. I'm Mike. We're the Brothers Murph. We'll see you later. Bye.